<clears throat> I have two texts of Scripture. Uh, I have an Old Testament text, and we have the text for the sermon in Revelation chapter 7. But first, Isaiah 49, which in part is actually quoted in the Isaiah or the uh, Revelation passage. Isaiah 49 is one of the suffering servant texts that look forward at the end of the day to our Lord Jesus Christ. And here Isaiah of old looks forward to this new covenant age when the servant of the Lord will be the means of great blessing not only to Israel but to the nations of the world, the day in which we now live. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage, saying to the prisoners, Come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, and all bare height shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar. Behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Senia. Sing for joy, O heavens. Exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. What a wonderful promise of the new covenant and the proclamation of its redeeming benefits throughout the world. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 7, where again we are greeted not with a prophecy, but with a fulfillment, with the reality at hand. Revelation 7, 13. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's Revelation 7, 9. Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
And one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them the springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray now that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and warm our hearts in the rich truths of thy word this morning, binding us to our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthening us, for you know how weak we are. And how uh, grateful we are this morning that we cry out to you who, who is the great shepherd, the one who does lead your lambs to those springs of living water. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we have come now to Revelation chapter 7. Uh, and we'll call it an interlude, or intermission, in between the sixth and the seventh seal. Kind of slows down the pace a little bit. But it also causes us to kind of stop and look back and reconsider from a little bit of a different angle, uh, the same time frame as the unfolding of these seals that culminate in that final day. But here the focus uh, is uh, particularly upon what God's doing with his people. What he's doing with his people on earth and now uh, what he's doing uh, with his people in heaven. Last week we saw the 144,000 sons of Israel. Uh, the Old Testament tribe. Uh, yet that Old Testament tribe is uh, symbolically uh, representing the, the totality of the collection of the New Covenant saints as the gospel goes out into the world. It's as if uh, John is trying to say to us what Hebrews 11 says to us. Uh, we have this great cloud of witnesses uh, from Abel up into the New Covenant, uh, but yet this great body is incomplete without us. But without, with, with us, we are a complete body. And that's what we see here. We see the completion of the children of Abraham. The totality, this great throng under this symbolic number of 144,000, which uh, ultimately is the, the collection of the totality of the Bride of Christ in, in chapter 21. And it's through the preaching of the gospel that... Uh, it tells us that they are sealed, sealed with the seal of the living God. Now, the genitive there can go in a number of different ways. It can be the seal uh, who is the living God or the seal of God. But in reality, the seal is both. It's both the God the Father's seal and the seal is God the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are sealed in the midst of great trial, securing that they will make it through securing that they belong to him. <clears throat> so between this time of the sealing of the sons of Israel and their eventual completion to a, a full, complete number, symbolically 144,000, we have an insight over something else that's going on. That's what's happening on earth. But there's something else going on in heaven at the same time. And that's the second part that we just read. Here is a 
is, is an international multitude that have been washed and are in heaven worshiping God. You see, we learn from this something that we need to learn from the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation, as John says, it's about the context and setting of trial. Yet in the midst of great deep trial, the onward advancement of the kingdom of God and the perseverance that is called for. You see, what we find here is that sovereign gospel train of inevitability of those who have their tickets purchased and punched for them. Uh, they will inevitably arrive uh, at the destination. They will inevitably arrive and stop and unload all 144,000 uh, in heaven. And so the first thing we want to draw our attention to is that heaven's chorus is here synthesized. Synthesized. Well, what does it mean to synthesize something? When you synthesize, you're bringing together. You may have a composition, and then you may have another part that you bring into that composition. And it renders the composition a little more complex. But it adds to it. And it adds to it so as to enhance it, to enrich it, uh, and to, Lord willing, that composition will be heightened as well. In here, we have this synthesization, this uh, uh, of the chorus of heaven uh, itself. Now, in <clears throat> verses 9 through 12, we can recognize something that uh, we have seen here uh, already. The throne of God and the Lamb. We have already been introduced to that reality in chapter 4 when John is raised up into heaven and in chapters 4 and 5, that's what he sees. But there's something else we've already been introduced to and that is there's a great heavenly throng uh, gathered around the, th the, the throne of 24 elders, uh, four living creatures, and in chapter 5, myriads and myriads of angels engaged in very dramatic, intense worship uh, of God. Uh, we have seen this already, but again, we're being reintroduced to it here. Verses 11 and 12, the angels are standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. Uh, and, and, and they're praising him. It, it, and it, it resonates though there seems to be a little bit more to it than what we heard in chapters 4 and 5. But besides what we've already seen being, as it is, reintroduced to us or, or, or for us to see again, there is a new element that is synthesized into that. And it's verses 9 and 10, this great uh, multitude that no one could number from every nation, tribe, and people, and language that are also before the throne and the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, even though this is a new element in this heavenly worship, there is something here also that we've heard before. Remember in chapter 5 about the, the blood of the Lamb has ransomed out of every nation and tribe and language and people, uh, a people of his own who, are, who he makes a kingdom and priests to our God. Here we find them now here, first redeemed, first claimed, first bought and paid for in history uh, by the cross of Jesus Christ, by the shedding of his blood, ransomed and secured. 
But now we find that same body, what was historically secured by the blood of Christ, are now collected in heaven in worship, praising God for his salvation. Well, it certainly should drive home to us uh, uh, very uh, happily uh, this doctrine of limited atonement. That for whom Christ died and shed his blood, they will inevitably, truly, genuinely, effectually receive the benefits for what he has done. Deliverance from their sin and arrival in their eternal home in heaven. And here they are. So we can kind of put all the pieces together. For whom Christ died, chapter 5, the Holy Spirit seals through the preaching of the gospel, the first part of chapter 7, and inevitably they make it without one lost to heaven, the last part of chapter 7. Here they are, gathered. And they're not just gathered. They're standing they're standing. Uh, and uh, that's how chapter 6 uh, ended, remember, the rhetorical question. The great day of his wrath has come. Who can stand? Well, the, that's a rhetorical question, the answer to which is nobody. Nobody that's an earth dweller can stand. But no, here are those who do stand before the throne and before the Lamb. This great multitude in white robes, robes of the very righteousness and holiness of heaven. Palm branches, those are victory branches in their hands. Victory achieved. Rejoicing in it. <coughs> now they had died. They had died, and you might think, well, you know, Death is the most miserable thing of human existence. And the Bible says it is. Because of redemption in Jesus Christ, the most miserable thing in human existence is the most fantastic thing of human existence. But it's graduation day. And so here they are, not dead, but alive, in heaven. And they add to the praise that's already going on in heaven. They synthesize with it and raise it now to an even higher level than before. And here's their contribution. Verse 10. They're crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The salvation of sovereign grace resounding in the halls of heaven, starting here, beginning with all eternity, well, here, not only holy, 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 but salvation belongs to our God and the Lamb. Election and atonement, applied and finished with this victory shout. A grateful shout it is. Which is not, a, it's just not, this is not just a kind of a, a, an abstraction here. Hey, we want everybody to know that salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. No, we are the recipients of it. This is a shout of gratitude, a shout of thanks to God that He has saved us by His grace. Him who sits on the throne and the Lamb. And there they are. Now they are, brothers and sisters. Now they are in heaven. 
praising God and the Lamb. Now the angels respond now to this added synthesis of heaven's now heightened chorus and joyous song. Yeah, joy. That's, that's come on both barrels blazing. Use an illustration from the gun show here. I hope you saw my note I put out there. On our, for our church, the gospel guns of grace are loaded and firing at this hour. That's right. And that's what we see happening here is this charge released is responded to by the angelic realm in verses 11 and 12. The angels are standing around the throne, around the elders, and they, and they say, Amen. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might to our God forever and ever. Amen. Notice, first of all, there's two amens. The last time we heard from this angelic crowd, there was only one amen. But now there's two. Beginning and end. It's saying now the, 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 the picture is reaching its completion of praising God for who's here amongst us. A double amen of finality. Second of all, a difference with regard to the prior praise in chapters 4 and 5 is the appearance of the word thanksgiving. Right in the middle. Seven words here and right smack dab in the middle is thanksgiving. Now this, this, is, a, this is praise. But in the center of this praise is thanksgiving because the great benefits of grace have been received and have come to full fruition of the presence of the redeemed in heaven. And the angels respond, adding thanksgiving to their praise. Now, the first three, blessing, glory, and wisdom, you might say are the prior. Wisdom. The wisdom of God's plan. The wisdom of God. What other wisdom could angels possibly be praising? Certainly not yours and your my wisdom. So glad you're here. You're so wise. No. God's so wise for bringing you here in His redemptive plan. What a wise, wonderful God and plan it is. A plan where He redemptively planned out blessing and eventual arrival in glory of those whom He planned to redeem. And then after the word thanksgiving, come honor, power, and might. The power of God that brought it about. The wisdom of God that planned it. The power of God that brought it into effectual accomplishment and realization before us this day to see this multitude from the globe with their white robes and their palm branches praising God. The wisdom and the power of God for which we now give thanks. Thanks to our God forever and ever. What a view here. What a picture of heaven. And then with this glorious, synthesized chorus at work, the angel steps aside and he says to John, who are these people? <laughs> who are these people? Who is this holy and happy throng that's been added to heaven's courts and have created such a joyous ruckus of holy praise? Who are they? Of course, John is 
utterly taken back. I mean, what would it be like in that moment? It'd be overwhelming. And he says, well, you know, uh, I don't know. And he said, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are they? They are those who have been tumbled and washed so that now they worship. Coming out of the wash, <laughs> nice and clean. It's interesting that the word coming here is uh, these are the ones coming. This is a present participle. So the sense here isn't these are the ones who have come and they're all arrived, but they are coming. In other words, they've been coming, they're still coming, and they'll continue to come. Brothers and sisters, that's the nature of heaven ever since Jesus rose from the dead. His people have been coming to heaven and populating it. And if you've recently lost a loved one in Christ, comfort your heart. They are assembled in heaven with these right here. The reality is their reality. And it's where you and I, if we are in Christ, are also headed. But it says they're coming out of great tribulation. I think this great tribulation is nothing other than what was said in the book of Acts. Through many trials, you must enter the kingdom of God. There are trials, there are difficulties to be endured, to be navigated, to be dealt with, to be overcome before entering heaven. That's the nature of life in a fallen world. That's the nature of life in a fallen world, where as John says, there is a kingdom that has come and tribulation has come out of it. The sleeping dragon has been sorely awakened in the coming kingdom and even chained and is full of wrath. It's through tribulation that they have come. Tribulation from the very beginning in the book of Acts and to the very end. When the beast in Revelation 13, John tells us, will wear the saints down. We can plan for this hostility that started in the garden to continue. But John goes on to say that this picture of this growing heavenly population of those who have died, those who have been sealed through the preaching of the gospel, are coming out of tribulation into heaven to worship God and add their worship synthetically to the worship that is already afoot. He then says in verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God. Um, it really, uh, those are two words there. Uh, there's the preposition dia, which is often translated as, is on account of this. On account of what? Well, on account of the fact that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. On account of this, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. In other words, John is saying, because they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, now they are before the throne and they serve God day and night in his temple. Because of the blood of the Lamb, they are now priests in God's palace, in his throne room, 
which is his sanctuary. It is where he dwells. And thus the blood of the Lamb is the grounds for why they're there. We must understand these are rank and file sinners like you and me. And they are washed white and functioning freely as priests in this heavenly place. They have been coming there. They are coming there. They will continue to come there out of this world of hardship and join this heavenly chorus where they will serve night and day. Now, this term night and day, I don't know if you remember, but this is what was said of the angels in chapter 4. They worship him who is on the throne night and day. This is the designation of the angelic occupation has now become the occupation of these who have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Those who've been sealed and tribulated and, and washed and now died are in heaven in this awesome worship of God. Let's get this straight. Let's get this settled. God saved you to make you a priest. God saved you to restore you to worshiping Him in holiness and in intimacy. That's it. That's uno number one. God did not save you to help you to become more successful. God did not save you primarily so you might go share the gospel. God did not save you so you could raise up a Christian family. God did not save you so you could be a better parent, a better child, or a better spouse. That wasn't the main reason. Now, all these can be ancillary reasons for God saving you. Hopefully, you're a better spouse because God saved you. Hopefully, you're a better employee because God saved you. Hopefully, your life as you walk through this world, is attendant with more joy because God saved you. But get it straight. The number one reason God saved you is that you might be restored to who you are as a creature in His image made to worship Him in delight and in holiness forever. And we have here in this very text before us where we are headed and what our chief occupation will be. We have here right before us that worship will be one of the most satisfying, unimaginable, intimate, drawing near to God in thirst-quenching communion with Him. And what I would like to say is holy happiness. Holy happiness. We're not there yet. We're still here, as far as I can tell. I don't think I'm looking at any, you know, non-tangible people. We're here. But brothers and sisters, what we must understand is every Sunday, every first day of the week when we gather, we begin here, now, what will one day be our sole, central, continuous occupation, day and night. You see?
worship, this worship begins now. See, that's what Hebrews 12 says. When we come to worship, we come to Mount Zion. That's what this is. A little picture of Mount Zion. It says when we come to Mount Zion to worship, there's angels and festal gathering. And it says there's the spirits of the just made perfect. That's who this great multitude is here. That's what worship is. In spirit and in truth. And even as they were washed, having come through great trial. So when we come to worship week by week, we come out of a week of what it is to live in this world of trial. You do not have to be giddy and happy when you come here for worship Sunday morning. Matter of fact, if you come distressed and weighted down, it makes sense. We're weak. We're in the tumbler. We're passing through trial. And we need God's grace. We need to be able to turn away from it and look to Him and know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And he receives us into his courts that he might feed us and give us drink and nurture our hearts in his worship. Now, you can take the boy out of tribulation, but often you can't take the tribulation out of the boy. And so you come on Sunday and you're leaving it all behind, right? But it's still all churning inside. <laughs> the day is going to come when you'll be out of tribulation outside and inside. And in the meantime, may God grant us the grace to negotiate those trials. May God grant us the grace to pass through them There's two great there's two great issues we tend to come to with worship that makes worship difficult. And they are addressed every week when you come here to worship. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Why do we keep saying the Lord's Prayer over and over every week? Because it's rich stuff. There's no end to the plumb line. And every week you need something very central to the Lord's Prayer when you come to worship. And we say it every week. And we need to stop saying it glibly, and we need to hang on to it with our right and our left hand in the desperation in which we come here with. Forgive us our debts. Because I know with all the variegated trials of life, I haven't handled everything spectacularly. Please forgive me. And then secondly, I know that not everything that has passed your plate and has been handled by your heart has felt good. You've been hurt by others. And maybe by others that... Why in the world are you hurting me? You know, you're supposed to be, you know, my friend, my father, my mother, my good sister, you know, my pastor, uh, you know. And so we say, forgive us as what? As we forgive. See, that's, that's the residual of trial, guilt, and hostility. And so when we come to worship, out of trial, God says, I want to deal with the residual. Forgiveness from me and to others through you. And so we find this great 
encouragement of royal and pastoral provisions for these worshipers. And I, I know my time is running out and just want to mention them quickly. They're worshiping before the throne and they're worshiping before the Lamb. And it says that he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And that's just a single word in the Greek. It's just he'll, he'll tabernacle them, that's what it says. In other words, he's, he'll, he'll throw his glory, his protective cloud. This is resonating, you see, with the passage through the desert. He'll throw his cloud over them so the, ray, the hot rays of the sun will not dry you out, but his, his cloud will protect you. He, he, he who sits in the throne will shelter you. He'll, ta he'll throw his tabernacle, his Shekinah cloud over you. And, and they're protected now in this heavenly region. Uh, you shall hunger no more nor thirst any more. The sun shall strike them. There's provision. This, this closeness and security of being Shekinah as it is enveloped under and within the, the covenant promise of dwelling with God. Secondly, there's the pastoral provision. There's, there's, there's the royal provision there, speaking of he who is on the throne. But now it comes to the lamb in verse 17. It says, for the lamb will be their shepherd. The lamb's your shepherd. He who spilled his blood for you now is alive and will, will be with you. He will care for you like a shepherd. He will guide you to what? Springs of living water. Your shepherd will direct you and lead you out of the dryness of this cursed fallen world and of your own sinful heart to the springs of living water. Refreshment. As believers in Jesus Christ, when we gather week by week, this is what we're coming into, to share in, to, to, from the position of earth to tap into. May God grant us the grace to discover that our chief delight is to draw near to Him in this kind of worship where when we recite the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, it's echoing up into those who have recited it before us, the people of God. And then it concludes with this little phrase that's developed further in chapter 21 of the new creation, that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And you think of what are the things that cause tears? Oh man, pain, grief, sadness, depression, heartache, disappointment. They all create tears in this world. We, this, this world by poets has been called a veil of tears. When we sang Psalm 84, Psalm 84 speaks about the tears of those who are making their way toward Zion. God says he will wipe away every tear. God, by his grace, reaches down out of heaven and he even begins in this world to begin wiping our tears away. You know? You've probably lost somebody and you cried when they died. But you know, as a believer in Christ, you sense God reaches down, He wipes away those tears. But He'll wipe them all away in the world to come. No more tears. You see, heaven will be a place of holy, eternal happiness. 
Heaven's mood will be permeated with this unsustained, with this unstained, sustained, pure, holy, deep joy forever. See, that's the other side of that coin of drying every tear. It's not just you're just going to say, okay, I'm in between now, you know, contentedly bored. No. There's the flip side of this, this animation. Some unbelievers have mockingly said, well, what are you going to do in heaven? Just, just be floating around, playing a harp, singing? Now, you, you've probably heard that type of mocking a suggestion of this truncated view of heaven. Hey, this is the core of it. We don't know what else is going to be going on, but we know what the core of it is. The core of it is we're going to be reunited to God and to each other in a holy joy, a tearless existence forever. That will be the centerpiece. The rest is not disclosed. It will be all to the glory of God. Amen. It will be all to unalterable joy and delight of his 144,000 who've passed through tribulation and are wearing white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. In the meantime, while we're not there yet, while God is sealing his people, as God is finishing off the collection of his holy nation. In the meantime, may God grant us the grace to pass through tribulation, to be overcomers, to begin raising the palm branch in this world. And finding that through the variegated trials of life, we can side and resonate with the Apostle Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. What he has started, he will see me through. Michael Horton, in his book, A Better Way, says that Sunday worship is a dress rehearsal for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We've got a lot to look forward to. We've got a lot to look forward to. Let us pray. Lord, we